Every spring we observe the same phenomenon. Snow-covered lakes begin to melt under the warm sun, and first sights of glimmering water are spotted in icy canals. It was quiet in the evening before, but now the steppe is filled with joyful bird songs. These are the first spring immigrants, Calandra Lux. They are followed by Eurasian coots, Eurasian teals, common porchards, pelicans, swans and waders. Truly a cheerful sight! Flock after flock cut through the blue skies. Here we can see a flock of bank swallows conveniently sitting on power lines. Those are the first groups of feathered immigrants. At slope steeps they are waiting for their brethren to begin building nests and burrows. The birds return to their native places to raise their offspring. Warm summer will pass. The birds will grow stronger and will continue their long journey along the route only known to them. This phenomenon continues for more than one millennium. What kind of mysterious force makes them fly over the mountains, cross the oceans, travel thousands of kilometers to reach the place of wintering? And why do feathered travelers return to the same nesting sites? I always asked myself, how do they find their way? They do not have our technologies to navigate through bad weather. They fly at night, during snow and rain, flying over the oceans. How do birds navigate in such conditions? There are various factors for this and there are several opinions on that matter. The most common one has to do with the magnetic field, that birds find their way along the magnetic field of the Earth. In addition, birds can very well navigate by the landscape. All migration routes have been learned for centuries by many generations of birds. Throughout the journey, young birds adopt the experience from older birds. There is also a version that flock follows another flock on a distance of 5 to 10 kilometers. I believe that this opinion has some legitimacy. Based on my own observation of geese flocks, what I have seen is that all flocks follow the same corridor, sticking to the same course. If the leading flock changes their direction, the following flocks will do the same. Yes, there is such an opinion. There are certain communication mechanisms between flocks, like a collective mind. If there is any disturbance on the way, the signal extends to the entire group. Birds are trying to avoid any danger on their way. Zoologists suggest that the travel experience of migratory birds is based on many factors. There are genetically driven instincts, diverse, just like the world of birds itself. Some may call it a biological clock. Birds in the instinct gives a signal. It is time to fly away now in order to have time to return to the nesting place on time. No less interesting are the migration routes that birds choose. To learn more about feathered travelers, we went to the Shokpak Ornithological Station. It is located on the border of Jambul and Turkestan regions, not far from the Shokpak Railway Station. The place itself is unremarkable, but that name is well known among people who are keen on birds, that there is the famous Ornithological Station. Soon, on a backdrop of evening sky, Huge nets stretched between pillars appeared on the horizon, the bird traps. And right in front of our eyes, under the pressure of strong western winds, flocks of rooks and starlings are flying straight into the snare. We were met by members of the field expedition of the Institute of Zoology. The expedition is led by famous Kazakhstani ornithologist Andrei Gavrilov. He is showing us the birds of prey that were caught in the nets. These are common migratory species. 
sparrow hawk and kestrel. This male sparrow hawk is a full-grown bird, and kestrel is a young bird, about one year old. The Shokpak Field Station was established in 1966 by the initiative of Professor Igor Dolgushin, the founder of the Ornithological School in Kazakhstan. Shokpak Station is located on the Shokpak Pass between two mountain ranges, Talasalatau and Karatau. The height of the pass is 1200 meters above sea level and the surrounding mountains are as high as 1400 meters. This location is one of the main migration routes in Asia. A huge number of birds fly through these natural gates. This happened because during autumn and spring birds' migrations concentrate along the mountains. Mountains are an environmental obstacle for many birds, and each species overcome this natural obstacle in its own way. Most species prefer not to cross the mountains and not to fly to a high altitude, but instead fly along the mountains, and gradually the migration flow will be merged together, meaning the number of birds will increase. And then the birds, thanks to the existence of such passes as Shok Park, cross the mountains. At the beginning of the last century, the Shok Park Pass was known as a good hunting sport. People were on the hunt for great and little bustards and quills flying through this pass. The game was sold on the Tashkent Bazaar. In the middle of the 60s, Kazakhstani ornithologists chose this place to study bird migrations. Much work on the organization of the Shokpak station was carried out by its first leaders, Ikar Baradihin and Edward Gavrilov. First of all, they studied weather conditions. The weather here is unpredictable – strong winds and snowy winters. Traps were set on the slope of the hills, utilizing the experience and methodology of the leading ornithological stations of the Soviet Union, located on the Kurskaya Kosa and in Transbaikalia. Nevertheless, if you compare similar ornithological stations, ours is unique. Nowhere else in the world, traps are located in open space, on a hillside. This distinguishes the Shokpak station from all others where Helgoland types of traps are used. We also call them fishing traps. The fishing trap is set in places of intense flight of birds. Like fish, birds that fell into the trap are captured within fake frames. They fly towards the narrow part along the corridor and eventually end up in the receiving chamber. Anithologists carefully release captured birds from the nets and place them in special containers. The bird can get into our nets only during the head winds. In this case, during autumn migration and western wind, the birds fly at low altitudes. During head winds, the birds fly closer to the ground. The stronger the wind, the lower they fly. According to this migration behavior, our traps are set on the hillside. Today the wind was blowing from the west. According to the weather forecast, the temperature is expected to drop lower. The birds sense that and seek to change their course in a more favorable direction, to the south. During such days, about 200 species of birds cross the Shokpak Pass. At the moment, the most numerous detachments of air fauna, the flocks of corvids, jackdaws and rooks are flying through the pass. But our nets also caught common chaffinches, pine buntings and desert finches. The birds fly through the pass constantly during day and night in rain and in strong winds. There are so many birds 
that it is extremely hard to count them. Scientists use binoculars and visual counting method. They watch the birds two hours before and two hours after the sunrise. If there are few birds, we count them individually. If a small flock flies, then we calculate how much space is occupied by five to six birds. That way we count them by dozens, sometimes by hundreds, and in some cases even by thousands. For instance, when we count rooks at the peak of migration, we registered more than 150,000 birds in one and a half hour period. Bird ringing is a laborious process that only professionals can do. In Kazakhstan, several dynasties of ornithologists are known – Gavrilov, Kovshar and Chalikov. The history of the establishment of Shokpak Station is connected with these people. The first head of the ornithology laboratory and the field expedition, Edward Gavrilov, is reminded of by a cozy large tent brought to him as a gift by the Arabs. In this tent they hold scientific conferences, consultations and meetings with foreign colleagues. And during field expeditions this is the place where ornithologists gather after a hard working day. Previously, 20 specialists worked at the Shokpak station, much less today. But thankfully, the station is getting help from volunteers such as Ramazan and Dahan Kudabaevs. This is not the first season at Shokpak for father and son, who have been mastering the subtleties of capturing and bird ringing for a while now. The most exciting moment, says Ramazan, is to release the bird back into the sky letting it catch up with the flock. Young Ahan, together with adults, studies the wisdom of ornithology. He knows what species of birds fly over the pass, how to ring a bird and willingly helps scientists in their difficult task. Ahan sees his future only in ornithology. I like everything about this place. I come here every day and help Grandpa Andre and Aunt Lena. I take ornithology lessons from them and expand my knowledge about the surrounding world. Birds are very interesting creations of nature. Their behavior sometimes surprises even most experienced scientists. During her 40 years of working at the Shokpak station, Yelena Chalikova has repeatedly observed an amazing behavior of birds. For example, when a bird falls into a trap, its flock usually leaves that bird behind. But now swallows and bee-eaters, they are waiting for their fellow travelers to rejoin them. Why don't they leave their brethren like other species? Why are some birds behaving like that? This is a very interesting question. These are burrowing birds, meaning they live in colonies and nest in burrow tunnels. That's their relationship model. It's based on mutual assistance. Yelena Chalikova first came to Shokpak in 1976 for an internship. Since then, she has been working in this field expedition almost every season. She is beckoned by the mysteries of the birds. Bird migration begins in early August and lasts until December. Spring migration begins in February until late May. Migration range depends on various factors. In the spring, the birds fly faster because they have a limited time frame for egg laying. In the fall, they begin to roam, gather in flocks and spend their time flying in search of food. They leave as soon as it gets colder. They fly from Siberia and northern Kazakhstan. Twice a year, millions of birds cross our country. Transcontinental bird migration routes lie through Kazakhstan, located in the center of Eurasia, connecting vast areas from Finland to Yakutia in the north 
and from South Africa to Malaysia in the south. The most effective method for studying bird migration is bird ringing. This method is more than a century old and is still used today. Anithologists put light metal rings on the claw of a caught bird, which indicates the country of binding and bird's personal tracking number. Initially, these rings were made in Moscow and were tagged with text in English language, Moscow. Then, in the 90s, the first Kazakhstani rings appeared. It read Kazakhstan or KZ and Almata. It was quite prestigious for our country, since this bird would fly all around the globe carrying this tag. Scientists measure each caught bird, its weight, size, species, age, nutritional state and other parameters, even the size of the wing and the condition of the feathers. After that, the bird is released. All the information is written to the research journal. During the last 50 years, more than 3 million birds have been ringed at the Shop Park Fields station and more than 5,000 rings were returned from 65 countries around the globe. Returned rings mean that the bird that was ringed on Shock Park Pass was caught by another ornithologist in another part of the world. First, these data go to the European Union for Bird Ringing, EU Ring. Then, EU Ring contacts organizations who are ringing the bird, asking for data about the place and time of ringing. That's how it works, the exchange and cooperation between scientists around the world. A huge amount of information about birds is stored by the International Data Bank of ringed birds and the data bank for the return of rings. Therefore, then comparing annual data, we can analyze what processes occur with the population of a given species. We can say what happens with the population, whether it has decreased or increased, or whether it stayed the same. The bird ringing practice enables scientists to trace the migration routes of many species of birds. Birds that were ringed in India, Turkmenistan and Russia were found in the territory of Kazakhstan, revealing some interesting facts. For example, the Great Goose migration distance extends from Western Siberia to Western Asia, and swallows fly for wintering to South Africa. There was a case when a swallow that was ringed in Kazakhstan got caught in Caucasia five days later. That's how fast they fly. Our station is widely known all over the world. We are contacted by foreign colleagues asking for assistance in collecting field material in the development of a particular topic. This year we met representatives of the Great Britain. We caught and ringed windchats and stone chats, various species of shrikes and lesser white throats. For these species we collected individual feathers for genetic examination. Each bird was marked with a metal ring. These data will be processed and we are hoping to get great results from this collaboration. In the 21st century, new tracking method was invented. Rings were replaced by miniature radio transmitters. The satellite system transmits detailed information about birds' migration. A few months ago, we had a red 
A week ago, we caught a black kite, we put a tracking device on it, and in 10 days we learned that it is currently on the territory of Tajikistan. Then on a dark night, we caught a rare bird, a female of northern goshawk. Last time we saw a goshawk in 2013. The female is large and beautiful. We attached a tracking device to it, as well as to rook and stock duck. Satellite technologies provide researchers with efficient and quick information on bird migrations, but is not ready to fully replace bird reading method yet. Transmitters give good results when determining the flight distance of a particular specimen. Metal rings, on the other hand, can provide data on the lifespan of a bird. No satellite transmitters can do that. They also have a limited working time frame of about a year or two, while metal ring lasts for decades. On the first day of our stay at Chok Park, more than 500 birds were caught. Ornithologists recall a record day of the spring of 1977. More than 14,000 birds were ringed in one day. Therefore, the Shock Park Pass is considered a unique place for studying feathered migrants. The second day at Shock Park was not as successful as the previous one. The wind changed from the west to the east. Birds fly very high above the ground. Together with Yelena Chalikova, we go to the forest belt, where three web-like traps were installed. Insectivorous forest birds usually fly along a forest belt. Therefore, they never fall into the trap located on station's territory. That's why those web-like traps are set here. Usually, only small birds are getting into the web traps. They stay alongside the forest belts to rest and feed. Small birds, such as leaf wobbler, silver wobblers, tit, pied flycatcher and thrush. Today, we also caught Turkestan tit. One should be very careful to understand from which side of the net the bird got caught up. Some birds are more difficult to retrieve than the others. This tit, for instance, got tangled pretty badly. A dragonfly was also caught by the net. Turns out that this insect is also migrating. Who would have thought that dragonflies also migrate? Unlike birds, dragonflies migrate for a couple of years from north to south. They breed along the way before continuing the journey to the south, leaving their young even farther. Unfortunately, we don't know where their journey ends. Then the cycle repeats in the opposite direction. This fall, more than 5,000 birds of 20 species were caught and ringed at the Shock Park station. Scientists methodically write down important data into their journals and computers. The unique aspect of this station lies in the fact that migratory birds are concentrated here during spring and autumn migrations. Observing birds in places of such concentration, we can learn about the state of the population of these species. This is the most rational method, since nesting birds are scattered over a large area. Here, on the Shock Park Pass, during the migration, we can study different kinds of birds in high concentrations. Here, 
The unique data from returned rings have been collected since the 50s of the last century. Institute of Zoology stores punch cards with primary information on returned rings. A punch card with detailed information was created for each ringed bird. It contained information like serial number of the ring, species of the ringed bird, place of bird ringing, date of the bird's last registration, and place of its death. Geographic coordinates, location of the place of bird ringing, the distance and time when the bird has been found again, were also recorded in the punch cards. An electronic database was created in the 80s of the last century, initiated by Edward Gavrilov. Technology development facilitated the work of ornithologists. Now, in a few clicks, you can access valuable information about the bird of a certain species, its migration destination, exact time and speed all relevant information about bird migration on a global scale. As we see on the screen, the first starlings were ringed in 1958. Since the beginning of the operation to this date, 56,217 birds were ringed in Kazakhstan. As you can see, it only took us a couple of minutes to access this information. Today, many birds are at risk. It is not possible to save migratory birds only at nesting sites. Dangers await them both during the flight and in wintering places. Many winged migrants die from poisoning by agricultural chemicals. In some countries, hunters are prohibited by law from hunting migratory geese and ducks. In others, they are hunted without restrictions. Many migratory birds fly through a number of Asian countries in which it is very difficult to obtain information about the bird rings. There are no ornithologists there. Even if they end up in people's hands, scientists simply don't get those rings, as those are never sent back. We must pay attention to the countries through which birds migrate. For instance, we do not exclude the fact that population of India might hunt significant amounts of migratory birds for food purposes. And then we wonder why we register such a low number of birds on our span. We definitely need international cooperation on that matter. The work of ornithologists on the start of migration provides new data which call for creation of interstate agreements on the protection of migratory birds. Despite the great interest in birds around the world, the situation in Kazakhstan's ornithological science leaves much to be desired. In the entire Central Asian region, bird ringing is carried out only at the Shokpak station. How will these data be used? Which field would benefit from it and why is it collected? First of all, the data collection must be continued to create uninterrupted timeline and we rely on help from the young generation of ornithologists. Unfortunately, I want to mention that the Department of Zoology of the Kazakh National University was closed, and our higher education institutions are not providing enough programs for zoologists. It's very important to restore the Department of Zoology. We have plans to launch a master's program at the Institute of Zoology to help graduates get sufficient training to become zoologists. For half a century, a huge layer of information about migratory birds has been collected at the Shokpak field station, information about the beginning 
and the end of winged traveler's journey. Each year brings new discoveries and new mysteries that young generations of the Kazakhstanian mythologists will have to solve.